Good morning. Good morning. morning. I'm Michael Picker. I'm the president of the California Public Utilities Commission, and I'm accompanied here by our executive director, Tim Sullivan. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present to you today. Uh, I, I'll just point out that this is my second year at the PUC. It's actually beginning of my third year. The first year as a commissioner. Last year is my first year as a president. And so I, I will tell you that the first year I spent trying to get to know how to work with the rest of the commission, the five voting members, in a different way than we've operated in the past. And I believe we've made a lot of progress to actually act not only as a body but as a governing body for the organization, which is a departure from patterns of the last four or five presidents. And so part of that is, is to build accountability. It, it's also been helpful in terms of getting some kind of, uh, of, of coherence in terms of how we look at, at, at some of our key functions, including safety. But having said that, I hope that this year is the year that I can actually spend more time with the legislature. I think that it is important, and I'll, this theme will come up in, in, in my overview, of over, overcoming some of the isolation of the CPUC. We have to maintain independence in our decision making. That's, that's, in, that's the point of the constitutional separation between us and other state agencies. But in this day and age, there are overlapping authorities that we share with other state agencies and issues of become so complicated and, and spread across so many different agencies that unless we learn how to overcome the, the, the barriers between the different units within the CPUC and with other state agencies, we will be less than effective. And I'll come to a sp very specific case or two, a couple cases that affect our ability to perform as well as we need to in terms of safety. So. Um, one of the, the very important tasks that we've been assigned is implementing portions of SB 350, and I think that that, that actually touches on the questions that you're addressing in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. The, the CPUC is not the only agency that has a task. The Air Resources Board has to establish an overall goal for 2030. Um, one of the things that's fairly evident from the, the early discussions with them is that only 20 percent of the state's carbon emissions come from the electric industry. 30 percent comes from the use of natural gas in, in heating, cooling, and, 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 uh, and other uh, residential and commercial uses. And 40 percent comes from transportation. So among the, the tasks that we've been assigned in, within uh, SB 350 is moving away from our, our previous patterns of procuring electricity to address the, the highly variable nature of electric demand in the state of California these days and the highly variable nature of generation to a integrated resource portfolio rather than the kind of, uh, of uh, uh, siloed process of many different procurement bundles that we require the utilities to meet. Uh, second is to then measure that against greenhouse gas reductions. Uh, at the same time, we're being told that we need to participate in this larger challenge of electrifying transportation and then energy efficiency, which, which I think will, will have many benefits in terms of reducing the use of natural gas for, for those residential and commercial purposes, all of which will help us to, to reach our greenhouse gas goals and to do that in a, uh, a cost-effective way. This is a, a significant challenge for us. It's one of the, the budget changes that we, we bring before you. But I also will say that it requires us to look at the way that we have built up our procurement in the past. It touches on some 14 different um, siloed procurement mandates that, uh, that are either internal or, or implement legislation and figure out how you wrap that into something that both gets generation but also uh, can develop procurement of demand resources in a way that, uh, that gets us a, a stable grid at a reasonable cost and gives more control to customers over their energy future. Um, it also requires us to work with other state agencies, and that means that we need to learn how to operate across boundaries. 
Another area that, that's important to us and you don't see uh, directly addressed in terms of budget change, uh, budget additions here is how do we deal with safety? And I think that, that, that a good example of, of how we have failed to work well with other state agencies is their, our, our inability to actually understand um, agencies like the Division of Oil, Gas, and Geothermal Resources in the, the Department of Conservation. We have have authority uh, that's delegated to us by the federal government to regulate natural gas pipelines. We do not have that similar authority for wells, and we don't understand wells. We don't understand things that happen 3,000 feet underneath the Earth's surface. We don't have geologists. We have very good gas pipeline engineers, and I think that we're seeing significant improvements in, in the way that they operate. But overcoming this barrier between state agencies who have similar authorities over um, uh, safety and integrity of gas storage facilities is increasingly important. And I think that we'll, we'll start to, to focus more and more and more on that through MOUs, through joint operations. I think that at the Liso Canyon, the, the sharing of information and analysis uh, uh, up to the point that the lawyers will let us in terms of the investigation uh, of the root causes of the, the leak at Aliso Canyon is an example of how we really need to step outside of the Bay Area and start to work with agencies that are spread across the state. Um, I think that we've made significant progress in terms of trying to rebuild the eroded safety programs that I discovered when I got to the CPUC. The first thing that we did is act as a body to adopt a safety um, um, uh, strategy and a, and a, 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 a goal. The, the, we've also adopted staff plans. The first staff plan actually focused on rebuilding the, the, the core units of the safety and enforcement division. The, this year's plan actually focuses on, on actually breaking down the barriers between our the safety and enforcement division and the rest of the CPUC, and then actually on implementing uh, uh, programs to integrate better with other state agencies. One of the consequences of that is, is it was we discussed yesterday in, a, in another commission uh, committee hearing is that we've decided there are some programs that we just don't do that well and that we can we can we can add value but basically they're duplicative of, of functions that other state agencies take take on and that's a, a example that would be our our oversight program for generation plants which is 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 also covered by the California Energy Commission and by the uh, the Office uh, of Safety and Health Administration in the Department of Industrial Relations. And since we're all doing the same thing, we ought to be able to figure out how we ensure that there's coverage and that we get regular reports that we can act on because they're regulated utilities as opposed to us simply going out and doing the same thing that people have already done that same uh, time period as we would do. I think that, uh, that uh, um, We'll see the Southern California gas general rate case um, concluded fairly soon. That's a, a place where we'll see a lot of answers to, to future concerns around uh, uh, such functions as Liso Canyon and some of the, the concerns we've seen from um, um, people in Southern California about the gas pipeline safety. I think for uh, PG&E, the challenge is that we have, have we, we sanctioned them with one of the largest utility fines of all history, uh, almost $2.25 billion in two different proceedings for one incident. And yet we still see uneven performance across the organization. So in this, this case, we've actually taken steps to begin a corporate governance examination of the company to figure out how is it that they continue to have uneven performance. What is it that the board of directors does and knows? How do they react to those things? And do we think that that's, that what we're seeing is just a process of them re reestablishing their safety programs, or is it a continuing failure of leadership within the company? And then to examine what it is that we need to do as the CPUC to take action on that. <clears throat> I think that, that some of the other things that I would point to are outcomes of the, the, um, the kind of uh, commission governance. Part of that is to establish accountability for the organization as a whole. Some of that is actually to establish accountability between the commissioners for each other. 
and, uh, and an example of the commissioners starting to actually um, um, uh, provide some standards for each other is our adoption of a job description and our upcoming adoption of a, uh, a code of conduct. We are also developing strategic directors for the entire organization and we'll be asking them to come back with metrics that we can use to then measure progress across the silos in the organization towards those directives. They range from greenhouse gas reduction to uh, reliability and, 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 or affordability, universal service. So I think you'll see future budget requests coming from us as the staff actually starts to move away from a simple program compliance to actual um, uh, performance set of standards. So I, don't, I, don't, I won't go into that yet because I think we have, uh, have some work to do to really start to get people to think differently about how they operate. But I'll also say that we have started to improve our overall administrative systems. I think we have a long ways to go there. And so one of the things that we discovered through our new internal auditor is that we don't have a centralized HR function across the organization. And I think this is very important. And so the challenge of, of trying to figure out in a agency where we're gonna lose something like 40% of our employees in the next three to five years because they are aging out of state service, how do you recruit key skills, particularly in high cost Bay Area? How do you actually begin to um, to train uh, managers to manage across a distributed organization because of the cost of trying to locate staff in the highly expensive Bay Area. What do we do about building succession programs? And so I think that you'll see stuff coming from us in, in the next year as we begin to develop that. I worry about growing too quickly in some of these areas. Uh, I think that, that we need to really establish a clear understanding and a, and a set of metrics for actually um, managing this as a commission rather than just asking for the money. But I just wanted to put you on notice that we'll, uh, we'll do that. So um, I won't go into some of our other compliance tracking programs. These are the ways that we begin to be get a better understanding of where we're succeeding and where we're failing. But I will point to uh, our, our BCPs this year that resolve around, revolve around three uh, themes. They're there are some uh, specific elements to, to improve our ability to, to uh, process uh, uh, our workload more efficiently and effectively. That's our BCPs one and two. Uh, and ensuring uh, vulnerable communities have access to telecommunications networks, that's at BCPs three and four. And then implementing legislation, uh, particularly SB uh, 350, which are our BCPs five through nine. So in total, we have five, nine, five BCPs, which amount to about 37 and the three quarters uh, personnel years. And, and the total of our request uh, is $292 million. Now out of that, 97% is actually a, a, a program to subvent um, subsidies to consumers. So a lot of our budget is money that passes through the CPUC, and I think that that's why I think it's very important for us to have these accountability measures and, 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 and internal auditing functions and compliance measures is because I think that we focused a lot on program but there's also a huge amount of money that passes through this through the CPUC and and as as even as a commissioner who's been there two year, I worry that we don't have the right kinds of financial controls to ensure that they are absolutely being spent in the most appropriate ways. They're very complicated programs and I think it's gonna take us a while to actually continue to audit our way through that to better understand them. So um, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I tried to be as brief as I could so that there was time for you to ask questions. My executive uh, director also would like to just kind of run a couple numbers past you. So. Yes, uh, good morning. I'm Tim Sullivan, the executive director of the Public Utilities Commission. Uh, thank you very much for both the resources and the authority that you've given us. Uh, we have a, a budget which is a little different than other agencies because we not only uh, uh, spend money given to us by the governor uh, and give it away to other people. We also control expenditures and other programs. Uh, our total governor's budget requests for the next year is uh, $1,772,000, no, $772,000,000, excuse me. Of that, about $142,000,000 uh, covers our operating 
our operating our operations. Uh, most of it is actually uh, passed through to income support programs. When I think about what the commission does, uh, I divide the programs into four areas. We provide access to infrastructure. We have we will have next year, if approved, a billion dollar program giving. Uh, low-income rural Californians, deaf and disabled, access to the communications infrastructure. Uh, we also uh, subsidize low-income customers and their use of electricity and gas. Uh, there is a 1.1 billion for that program, of which about uh, 850 uh, million is done through rate structures, uh, rate design in our regulate, regulated monopolies. And about 250 uh, million is collected and given to uh, gas companies that serve low-income Californians. We also spend another 250 million on books on our budget uh, for uh, the Energy Saving Assistance Program, which deals with insulation for low-income uh, customers. Uh, we also have a major safety program, uh, and uh, we have. Uh, uh, been making progress. We had a safety action plan last year, uh, which uh, uh, your chairman, uh, Assemblymember Bloom, we, we shared it with him, uh, and he asked us to come back in the scorecard and tell us what we'd gotten done. And what we're trying to do is focus on changing actions on the ground. But we're responsible for uh, the safety of the electric and gas infrastructure, the rail infrastructure, uh, and uh, uh, a variety of other things. Uh, what you tend to think of us is in terms of uh, our traditional regulation program, and that's really what most of the $142 mil million dollars pays for. You, you know that in our rate cases, and it's usually the types of things that come before you. But over the last number of years, our environmental programs have been growing. In this year, there's a major budgetary request for the implementation of SB 350, uh, which is an effort to control greenhouse gases. Uh, we also have, uh, not on our budget, but we oversee another billion dollars in energy efficiency expenditures that are done uh, through uh, the power companies. Uh, I'm uh, going very quickly through a couple of slides. Uh, it turns out our funds don't match directly into the programs that I told you about it, but uh, uh, slide four just shows you where the money comes from, and that adds up to the one. Uh, $1,772,000,000. Uh, we uh, have a quick overview of our BCPs. Uh, that was done by President Picker, so I won't repeat that. Uh, I have uh, two slides which are detailed on the income qualified programs to give you an idea where it comes from, where it goes. I'm not going to get into that. What I do want to talk to, to you about is the, the reform measures that we're making in conjunction with uh, President Picker's leadership. Uh, we think of it in four areas of operational goals. Uh, the first is compliance and engagement with California government oversight. Uh, we've spent a lot more time uh, talking to members, reaching out, uh, providing the data that they need. Um, we are also we've hired an internal uh, risk and compliance officer who's tracked down the recommendations of every audit that has been conducted in the last several years, uh, and she is going through audit by re audit, recommendation by recommendation, to see what we've done, what the status of each are. Uh, I wish I could say that we have a, a great record, uh, but we don't. We have an improving record. Uh, we, she has also created a master list of all reports that are due to uh, sister agencies, federal government, uh, local government, and uh, legislatively mandated. Uh, to get this work done, we have a major program for inculcating core values in our workers of accountability, excellence, integrity, open communications, and uh, stewardship. My goal is to make us uh, be a learning organization and to implement uh, a strategic plan. I also have a list, uh, an overview of the major accountability uh, uh, steps that we've taken. Uh, the single probably most important one is now we can create a database that tracks every, th every ordering paragraph that the commission issues. We assign each paragraph to an employee, uh, and they track the compliance. This is on our public website. 
not the employee's name, but all the other parts, uh, when, the, when the compliance was due, what the status of each thing is, and how it goes. We also have databases on workflow management uh, that track the processing of commission proceedings uh, and also uh, the processing of tariffs and advice letters from, from utilities. We have, uh, President Picker mentioned our internal audit unit, uh, but I've also, we also have supplemented that uh, with the uh, compliance uh, and the risk assessor. Uh, we've done a number of other things and we're developing a statewide strategic plan. Uh, I know last year when I came and testified, uh, you, you discounted the, pros the promises that we had made uh, saying, uh, you know, you had heard promises before. I think we've accomplished a number of things. Uh, we still have more, a long way to go, uh, but I wanted to thank you for the, uh, for the resources and commitment you've given to us, and I promise there will be more next year. I also wanted to introduce my fellow commissioner, uh, Mike Florio, who's joined us here today. A again, we're operating as a, a governing board and as a commission, and I think increasingly when you hear from us, as you, many of you have probably met Commissioner Leanne Randolph, who's my co-chair of our legislative subcommittee, um, we will speak as a body or we'll just, we'll be honest as I did yesterday in the Utilities and Commerce Committee and tell people when you're giving uh, a personal opinion or, or a personal position. Um, and so I want to thank him for joining us. And I just want to kind of highlight that that's a fundamental difference between us and the last three presidents. Great, thank you very much. Any questions, uh, Mr. Patterson? Mr. Williams. Uh, so a couple, Questions about um, uh, so you as you outlined, 30% of the emissions are uh, natural gas and 40% are transportation. For us to deal with um, either of these, uh, we will either have to use a lot less, or we'll have to do some transitioning to renewable natural gas. Um, you have a mechanism now for interconnection and an aid pot for interconnection um, for, for electrical interconnection uh, for uh, no for for oh, biomass natural gas, or biogas okay um, uh, it's a, it's a 40 million dollar pot uh, uh, it's 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 small and as such you, you have to have small awards um, do you feel like given the context of how many anaerobic digesters are coming online in the next couple years um, and how much we will need this supply that that will that that fund will be adequate uh, I, I suspect that it probably won't be but it can be supplemented by utility expenditures as opposed to direct expenditures through the CPUC so I think a lot of the interconnection funds are really uh, subventions to help at the site of generation the big challenge is always that the places where you have good sources of uh, of, uh, of material for anaerobic the red, uh, anaerobic digestion aren't really close to consumers and they're not close to the natural gas transmission pipelines. They tend to be very thin distribution <coughs> pipelines. And so y y when, you, when, you, when you start to build new facilities, you start to need new infrastructure. And that I think is gonna take a little bit of planning and a little time for us to really set it up and get in the way. On the other hand, there are opportunities that we have not exploited in the past simply because of, uh, of, of some, some significant uh, um, uh, standards that stood in the way of actually being able to, to, to do that. So there have been some successes, and I'll point to the Sacramento Municipal Utility District, where their strategy has been to co-locate generation to whatever extent with the, the, the uh, anaerobic di digesters. They have 14 different digesters that are a significant contributor to some of their, their local needs. And, uh, and so I think we're gonna see a balance as we start to move into that. I think that there's no one solution and I would hesitate to say that we have a perfect plan. It, when you have so many different distributed generators and there's so much choice by individual um, um, uh, facilities, it, it becomes a challenge to then try to deal with it in a highly centralized planning set, uh, setting. 
And then just a, a, a sort of um, question about um, the the big. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll do that that second. I, you know, the the. Do, do you guys have any plans, given that um, the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab um, is about to a answer some of our most uh, fundamental questions about the potential of demand response? You guys had a proceeding last year. Was it advance of in advance of that? that? Do you have any plans to? Uh, I'm skeptical that, that we'll. I, I'm skeptical that we'll see great new breakthroughs from the LBNL report. I think that there's an in, incredible promise from various forms of flexible um, um, and uh, dispatchable demand. And uh, I think that the biggest breakthrough we're likely to see is the these new programs for time of use rates. My experience at the Sacramento Municipal Utility District is that in their test program, which involved 100,000 households and 13 different approaches to time of use rates, they got a, a, the, a minimum response of 13 percent. And given that the bulk of their demand comes from residential consumers, 13 percent of, of customers who are willing to move their time of use away from peak to, uh, to off peak during those, those hot summer days is an, is an incredible example and far outstrips any of our other uh, demand response programs. The ones we have are very productive. But I think that, again, this is, this is a new world that we're moving into that involves rather than, f than three big, five big electric utilities and, 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 and several large gas utilities, we're moving into programs that, ca that call for us to engage with millions of consumers who are really the actors. And so a entry level into that has been the success of the, of the rooftop solar programs. And I think we'll start to see the time of use uh, rate that we've built into the net energy metering starting to actually um, be one of the, the, the leading uh, edge programs there. Those customers are people who are engaged in energy production and are thinking about it. And I think that they can help lead the way for other people into the rest of the time of use programs. Thank you. Thank you. There are no further questions, so thank you very much for your presentation. No, thank you for your patience. Seeing you. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I apologize. Mr. Obernolte, I looked right past you. Sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, President Picker, uh, I enjoyed your testimony before the U Committee on Utilities and Commerce yesterday. In, in that testimony, we were discussing. I'm sorry, we need to bring the price of cable down so that you have more choices. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we were discussing the implementation of SB 350 and uh, it was pointed out that when the remo removal, uh, renewable portfolio standards was first passed in 2011, there was a requirement from the legislature that the PUC report back to the legislature on the cost off-ramping and how well utilities were meeting the mandate within those cost limitations. And the fact that th that was supposed to be delivered by January 2016, it hadn't been done. And in the, answering the question of why, you said that it was a manpower problem and you just didn't have enough manpower to meet those requirements. And in looking at the budget change proposals, I don't see a request for more money for that manpower. And I'm wondering uh, what we can do to help you meet those, uh, those reporting requirements. I I don't know that I think it's an organizational manpower. It's probably a priority issue, and I don't think that we've always prioritized legislative requests in the way that we need to. I think that what I was specifically saying is I don't have the brain power to answer your question and I promise to get back to you. It's just a, a matter of my bandwidth to be able to really give you a proper answer. And so I promise to meet with you to, to, to satisfy that. I will say that what we've seen is a, is, a, is a plummeting pricing in terms of renewables, particularly wind and solar PV, that now makes both wind and, and solar uh, directly competitive with new natural gas and, uh, and wind projects. The challenges with these technologies isn't really in the pricing. It's really in the, the fact that they're highly variable and we, most of our, our, our systems and planning have been built around a uh, baseload system, which is probably not what we need in terms of consumption, but we still need to really make that transition and start to figure out how we implement these variable resources. I think that the cost is, has come down fairly dramatically. The real, the real challenges will be how do you integrate it uh, effectively and affordably. So when do you think we will see that report? 
as soon as I can get back and have a meeting with my staff and, and I'll get back to you with an answer. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. We look forward to hearing more in the coming weeks. Thank you. And again, uh, thank you for your patience. Thank you very much.